So here we are at Abbey Road in London. This process is over 60 years old. So we're putting 21st century technology into this and nothing's changed for 60 years. So if you can cut a record that sounds okay, that's actually brand new, you're doing, you're doing all right. Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. Sitting here with a rather wonderful Mr. Jeff Pesh. How are you? Very well, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. You've, you've had a pretty amazing journey. To say the least. Where, where were you born again? You were born in, in the view of, uh, of, of the stadium? And no, I was, I was born at, um, at Archway, so about two miles away. Right. So, uh, yeah, North London and born and bred. Never lived anywhere else. Never, never lived outside the M25. Lovely. Yeah. I have you here as starting as a mo motorbike messenger at Tape One Studios in Camden. No, it was in, off Tottenham Court Road, yeah, it was in the West End. Yeah, I was a bike messenger for a year. Yeah, um, and they were in. They were quite ingenious. Tape one. They um, had their own bike messenger, which was me or people before me or after me, and we would. We didn't use Addison Lee or um, uh, motorbike couriers. We, we. I was their messenger, so I went and got their work and took their work back. So I would go around to United Artists in Mortimer Street, take my crash and went off. Go in, say hello, girls. Uh, got anything for tape one? Yeah, yeah. Here's here's some tapes. Back you go. And then I would take the, the cuts back and the masters back and so on. So it was mainly West End because all the record companies were in the West End, you know, sort of late 70s. So, um, I, 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 yeah, I'd go to RCA, uh, Arista, United Artists, all of them really, phonogram during, during the day. And then because I used to bring back work and more work, my boss said to me, well, you, you're quite enterprising, so we're looking to train a disc cutting engineer. What do you think? So I said, yeah, I want to get off the motorbike, but I wanted to be a photographer, you know, because I was 18, you know. So, so um, it seemed more glamorous. Yeah. Yeah. So um, they said, look, give it a try. So I got off the motorbike in, into, into a room like this, but not as glamorous, um, and started to train to, to cut records. And then what happened was I actually cut some records, some seven-inch singles for somebody, and um, because my the guy that was training me was on holiday. So while he was on holiday, they got the test pressings back and they were overjoyed with them. And they spoke to my boss and said, Dennis, who was training me, Dennis has done a really good job with these ones. And um, Bill Foster said, well, Dennis didn't cut these. I said, well, who did? I said, well, Jeff did. Who's Jeff? And there you go. That's so, incredible. What were the songs? I can't remember. Some heavy metal label from Newcastle. I think. Okay. It wasn't great. But it was music. All right. So, right. And here we are. Well, that was, there you go. Done. Here <laughs> we are. Thank, thank you very much. Good night. Yeah. Um, how, so you were a teenager? Yeah, 18, yeah. I'm now 62. So you were cutting records at 18 years old? Yeah, so I cut a number one record when I was 19. What was the number one record? It was called um, Heartache Avenue by the Masonettes. Oh, okay. okay. They were one-hit wonders. I think they had two two singles, but it was a bona fide number one single. So uh, Christian Wright didn't cut a number one single till he was forty-two. Your your co-patriot here. <sighs> well, yeah. It's only because I started earlier than everybody else, so my rap sheet's bigger. Because I've just done it for a rap longer. sheet. Yeah, <laughs> it's just bigger. So yeah. Um. So, uh, my note here is gained a reputation for cutting vinyl lacquers for famous records, like Dire Straits Brothers in Arms. Yeah, well, that's, um, that's a bit of an anomaly, but I definitely cut the record. Yeah. But the, it was mastered in New, in New York. Yeah. Um, but with records, they have to furnish every continent. So, um, the records for America are cut in, the vinyl parts for America are cut in America. The vinyl parts for Europe are cut in Europe. So, records used to be, they used to have projected sales for records. So, Brothers in Arms, Dire Straits, they thought well and correctly, that's going to sell millions, and it did. So, to furnish every European territory, at Tape One, Dennis and I over a weekend, we cut 15 sets of that record. Now, cutting wow. records is a real-time process. I believe the sides are 23 and 22 minutes long because when you cut eight sets of something in a day, money for nothing, your chicks for free, it kind of sticks in your head. 
Yeah. So I know how long that record is. <laughs> Just so on on the Saturday I cut seven sets, say, and on the Sunday, Dennis cut eight sets. Each set of lacquers went to a different factory. Some maybe five in the UK, and the rest dotted around Europe to press the millions of records that were projected sales for that album. Incredible. Yeah. And there was lots of that going on. If it was a, a major release, you always cut two sets of, of lacquers at least, and you can't rip a record. So it's real time. So we're, we're like lawyers, we, we build time. So if, if, you, if you're working in here for 10 hours, it's 10 hours build. So after that, you worked at Utopia? Yep, smaller studio, um, a, a studio and a mix room and a, a first class mastering room with a big fish tank. <laughs> so underneath the speakers at the front of the room, it was all wood panelled. And there was a, uh, a tropical fish tank that was the, 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 between the speakers. So it was probably eight feet long, maybe 10 feet long, full of tropical fish. So what used to happen, it was fantastic. It was better than the mirror ball in here. It was, um, it took, it, 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 it was a deal break, a icebreaker. People would come in and they would gravitate to the fish bit like you did with looking out the window. <laughs> so th then you've broken the ice. So they come in, they go, oh, look, there's, a, there's, there's one of those mini shark things or an angel fish or whatever, and then give you the tapes and then just look at the fish and buy it. You know, you're three tracks in before they've even thought, well, oh, we should be paying attention here. It, just, <laughs> it was just a wonderful, wonderful icebreaker. And that, that, room, that room was great, but they didn't, it was, it was underfunded and, you know, so somebody else phoned me up for a job at the time, so I left. And where was that? Masterpiece? Yes, Masterpiece, which used to be called Copy Masters. So um, Miles Scholl, who also works here, we started their mastering. They didn't have mastering. So um, they bought some bits and a cutting lathe and, and, and sort of got this ramshackle room together. But they got two really, really good mastery engineers to, to staff it. So what happens is you're, this is like hairdressing, you're... <laughs> Your client base follows you. So when Miles and I went there, obviously we'd said it, we'd, we'd let all our contacts and clients know that we were moving. So when we moved, the phone was already ringing. You know, when can Jeff do this? So literally after a week after setting up, we were just as busy as we were down the road. And that's what happens with this. I didn't, I didn't send a CV to Abbey Road. You know, lucky Jeff. <laughs> Lu Lu Lucy phoned me up. So, um, you know, that's, that's great, isn't it? Well, we can't miss out, before Abbey Road, the townhouse. Well, that's a, that's a studio that is now flats. I mean, the, yeah. the, the discs that you see on the wall in here, they were all cut there, with the Kylie Records pulp, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, the Britpop era, you know, mid, well, mid-90s. I mean, you couldn't, you, you just couldn't, so much work. You just, you're falling over it. You know, but also you've got to be good enough to fall over it. You know, Absolutely. Th those records didn't get sent to Camden Market to get cut or mastered. <laughs> you know, they they so. But that time for a mastering engineer was great because there was there was r some really really good British pop music that went all over the world that was just like and and, and was popular with everybody, and it was just great to be a part of that. You know, I I. I the townhouse was just, just fantastic. No, it's great to work here, but the townhouse was fantastic. And then, of course, you had that sort of Hugh Padgham, Steve Lillywhite era. From yeah, all, the early all, 80s. All, all, all breezing through. Yeah. Um, you know, we all used to stop for dinner at seven o'clock and you know, with the studio people because it was much smaller than this. There were, there were three studios there and, and two mastering rooms. We'd all stop, all stop for dinner. And you'd go around to dinner and, like, Van Morrison would be sitting over there, you know. Um, you just, just peak, just people. Yeah, Eric, Eric Clapton. You know, just, you just see these people, and you're sort of like, oh, you know, you're a little bit. You're not starstruck because you see these people a lot, but you are. You look and you think, is that really Eric Clapton? And it is. Same here. There's, there's, there's people here, but because it was so small there, right. you couldn't help bumping into people in corridors because it was smaller. It was just brilliant. It's a great studio. Shame it's flats. I know. Never really quite fully understood how it could have gone under. Well, they just they just underinvested. Sanctuary bought it, 
and then that was the writing on the wall really the the, the, the technical just fell away and they wouldn't spend any money and, mm. and you could say so when when you know when Lucy phoned me up I thought mm, this will this will be good this so and I, and I was right so you came here in 2006 yes February 2006 oh. where does where does the time go were you were you ever a musician no or? I'm not a musician but I'm musical right that's what right. I say to people um, I'm a I can hear tonal change uh, and I'm I'm a music fan. That's very important, uh, certainly with mastering, because you have to, um, in a short space of time, you have to uh, just 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 like the style. We're, we're cross genres. We work on you know everything from rock to rap. So you 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 got to be a music fan. You can't just say you like you know, Guns and Roses and be a mastering engineer. It's just not, <laughs> you, you've got to uh, embrace all. So you've got to be a music fan. And this is a great job for a music fan. Absolutely, yes. Mm. Um, what kind of, in, I suppose this varies from project to project, but what kind of interaction do you get with like the artist? And... Depends. Some, most, because most of the people that I work with know me from previous projects or know of me, from previous projects to the internet, it's a wonderful thing. Um, they they know because of YouTube. They know me. They, they, I don't know them, but I walk into reception. Hello, Jeff. I'm, I don't know you, but they've, <laughs> they've seen me about. So, um, yeah, I mean, they, they, some people. Sometimes this is like counselling. People just talk to you about stuff, mm -hmm. and that's that's some of it's not related to the music, and it's you're you're trying to let the artist let it go because they've mixed it ten times. Over and mm. over and over again, the computer age now you can recall vocals in the middle of the night, you know, whatever. And now, today, mastering, we're letting it go. You know, you might revise it, you might whatever, but today, this is just, it, it's almost on Amazon now. I know you said record shop, but record shop, you know, record shop doesn't exist, does it? So it's, it's about coercing musicians and uh, often engineer producers to let it go. Right. And a final check test, obviously. I, I find as a producer, engineer, mixer, I love mastering engineers because I can call up and go, what do you think of my mix? What should mm. I be doing differently? What mm. I... The headmaster. Yeah. Sonic headmaster. Yeah, because you're dealing with 200 different mixers mm. as opposed to one. So yeah. you... You can tell me, oh, I love this guy because he does this and I like that. You yeah. try that. Yeah. Hmm. It's, it's that last step in the process. Where you yeah, and now it's even more important because more and more people now are not, work, not making records in studios. They're mm -hmm. making records in small rooms, sure. mixing on headphones, little boxes like that. So the, 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 some, the low end sometimes doesn't work. So to have somebody else with a lot of experience, actually, like you just said, mm -hmm. check in your mix in an environment like this, a controlled listening chamber if you like and all that acquired knowledge yeah kind of so if, if if i if i offered you a sonic opinion you can take it or leave it but you're probably gonna, you're probably going to take it yeah yeah exactly um now obviously there's a lathe sitting behind cutting lathe yeah 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 never worked in a room without one Very how often are you cutting uh this morning before i saw you nearly every day record store day um just B b gave the birth to the vinyl resurgence. Um, so because we're we're backed by Universal, we've got the Universal catalogue where we're we're cutting stuff, you know, Wonderful. But, uh, over and over and over. So there isn't really a day a shift, and I'm in here alternate days um, where I don't either check a test pressing or cut a record, which is which is a bit like 1980 really, when it was all records. So it's it's and, and these things you know they're forty years old, and they rattle on, and still sound beautiful. You know, who made this? Particular? Neumann. That's a Neumann. The company that make the microphones. Yeah, German Swiss precision. You know, but they're 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 beautiful things. How's the maintenance on them? Are they pretty bulletproof? Well, or? that's good. That's a good question. Um, the, the the guys that look after them are dying off. Mm. The guys that had the original circuit diagrams, we have some here. They're no longer around. There's one guy left for the UK and Europe for our 
technical maintenance, who's a, who's a third party that we use. So when he retires, I mean, a lot of it, we, we, cause you know, between, between all of us here, there's a lot of cutting experience. So we can, we can find it and it's all circuit boards. So we've got a great tech set up here. So we, we can find the fault. They can repair the board. But if it's something, you know, heavy like a, uh, a turntable motor or a lead screw, something that's engineering mm -hmm. those parts, cut heads, those parts are no longer available. So kid gloves. Well, mm. maybe buying a couple of machines for, just for spares. Don't exist. They've all been uh, gobbled up by factories, uh, record factories. Um, they're, they're just not available for sale. So the price has gone through the roof. But they're simply not available, Warren. You know, it's just can't can't find enough of them. Terrible. Mm. They need to uh, they need to bring cloning up quickly. Something, yeah. <laughs> they put a man on the moon, but they can't build a new cutting lathe. Strange, really. <laughs> Money talks. That, that, that's the answer to that one, isn't it? Yeah, well, actually, it swears. <laughs> <laughs> this question here um, is actually like a. It's it's a fan question like this is a mm. question i get asked all the time okay. i've never actually asked a mastering engineer i've interviewed many um, right. what are you checking on you're you're checking on environment things you know you know um you've got the bowers speakers you've got some ns10s here um are you have you been moving recently into listening on like phones and earbuds and stuff like that to see how people are hearing personally i use the two sets of monitors in this room the yeah. ns10s and the, and the and the bowers and wilkins nautilus things right so if it sounds fine in here to me through those both those sets of speakers it will sound fine on Auntie Glad's dance set. <laughs> a cheap pair of headphones, an expensive pair of headphones, a Nokia phone, and a Samsung phone. That's right. these these monitors are my point of reference. If you come in with your phone or your laptop and you try and influence me sure. to make it sound great on your laptop and bypass this lot, mm -hmm. I will say I won't do it. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, this is my this is my sonic point of reference. This doesn't change. Um, and my perception for whatever I'm working on is made through these monitors. They just don't change. Do you feel, because I was having a conversation, we were talking about this uh, yesterday. Uh, do you feel um, influenced at any point by trends over, I mean, you've got a career from... Well, that's a good question. 44 years. Kind of, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you if you, if you you turn up doing this, if I turn up one day, right, in a kill, um, <laughs> playing the bagpipes, right, it's not really going to be Jeff, is it, right? Or the next day I turn up with a pair, a nice pair of Nike Air Jordans in a basketball vest, right? What am I doing? It's all about my ears and sure. how I how I perceive it. So I've I've gone I've gone through many 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 fat. Well, I said Britpop, didn't I? I was at the end of punk. Mm -hmm. I've I've gone I've gone through many many genres with with, with popularity, but my uh, my sonic judgment has remained the same. The re records, music files, have to sound clear. If you're clear and loud. Whatever the genre, from from Max Roach to Max Edrum, you're <laughs> you, you, you're winning, you're winning, and most of the guys at the top level in America are in are in their sixties. Sure, they're 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 because Bob Ludwig just announced he's retiring last week. Oh, good, we might might get more work. <laughs> um. So your it's it's it's, it's a, most things it's experience. Mm -hmm. It's not about this. Isn't about hearing um, ultrasonic frequencies that only dogs can hear, because none of that is in music. The nuts and bolts in music it's it's all in the mid range. It's all it's all where are the guitars? Where are the drums? How loud's the snare? You know, even in classical, you know, violins. You know, it's all mid range. So if you can still hear that and hear the changes, you can do this forever. I believe. Absolutely. But with formats, of course, extended low end, mm. you know, over the last few decades, it's got bigger and bigger. Yes. So uh, I suppose your this is your environment, which you know really, really well. Mm. Obviously, the Bowers are huge speakers. They re reproduce 
massive range. Are you are you conscious of what other people do? Um, I mean, the thing is, nobody has a setup like this in their home. We're reducing everything now to an Alexa speaker or a, mm -hmm. some some kind of phone. So why <laughs> why people would want to people making records would would want to put an extended low end into something that mm -hmm. isn't going to get played in a nightclub? Because phones and laptops don't have any low end. Mm -hmm. So, you, but you still got to cater for the people that have a five grand listening room. So when it's mastered, as I said earlier on, yeah. it should sound fine on everything. Hopefully, that's the trick. That's that. That's a hard thing to do, isn't it? Because when when people approve stuff, they say, "Oh, I, I played it on the five grand stereo. I played it on the phone. I played it on the laptop. You know, again and again and again and again, and it sounds fine." So there you, you cracked it. That's it, I think. Mean. Absolutely. Okay, here's, here's another one which I think gets asked, uh, for me to ask people. Uh, how much do you feel like your job is technical versus creative? Uh, I would say... <sighs> 60, 40 in the technical... Mm -hmm. because we are we are techies. I should be sitting here in a white coat with a pen in the top pocket, but we're more funky than that, you know. So we are, the the, the creativity is kind of all, all, it's done before before mastering. This is, the, this is the cherry on the top, the sugar coating. But we have to create all the formats, especially vinyl. Vinyl's a very, very technical skill, vinyl. Um for it to work in a factory environment and move on and track one isn't missing. So it is, a, it's a very, it's a technical job, but we are, we are, we're able to mask the technical aspect of it through, I think both personality and, um, just the tools that we have. A good mastering room is, is, is minimalist. There's not racks and racks of stuff in here. There's a there's a desk full of stuff that Christian and I like, so they're they're our tools. We don't need to keep wheeling stuff in here, and you know, so the um, the creative aspect really is. Um, I was always told keep the signal path short. So if you can do that in here, then I'm not encroaching too much on your mix. You try and change the mix mastering, you're snookered. Right. Just respect the mix. For, so I, the feeling I'm getting now uh, with mastering engineers is the detail work is moving more into the box. Like getting in there if there's like very specific frequencies. Yeah, a little correct. bit, yeah. The, the ability now with digital to do that. I is that, is that what you, do you still find that you have analog tools that you prefer? Well, I'm, to to I'm totally old school. There's only, there's only right. one plug-in that I use for loudness and the rest of it is analog. So everything you see in front of you right. that goes click, 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 I'm using it all the time. So I am, because I'm uh, long in the tooth with this, I come from an analog background and I've always maintained that wherever I've worked, I've had the best of the analog available to me and I can sell that to you when you come in here, just sonically look. And most of the people that come in here are using this stuff through plugins, so they want to see the hardware. You know, the EMI stuff. I mean, you know, we've been making, been making the plugins for years. The first question, oh, do you use this? I use the plugin. Or do you like the plugin, Jeff? I don't use the plugin. I use the real deal. So I'm an analog guy. So, and there's, there's room for all of it. You know, but you you can set yourself up with a with a computer full of plugins and become a mastering engineer at home, can't you? But but what sort of mastering engineer are you? Are you a good one or a bad one? <laughs> or just somebody who has a lot of tools that say mastering? Well, it's so subjective. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can you can you can set up and get lucky and, and make a record that everybody likes with your because that's what happens. You work on a record that's um, popular so people talk and who did that and, and you know mastering credits on the back of sleeves get 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 you work i mean that pulp different class i mean that's that got me so much work just like unbelievable from from 1995 onwards 
you did this, you did that. Da, 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 da. That's, that's what happens. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? Yeah, remember it very well. Mm. Can you tell me a little bit about the online mastering process? Well, we have a thriving online business here. Great idea. About, I think we've been doing it for probably about eight years now. Wonderful. Fantastic. Saved the business through the pandemic. Um, the, the, the way it works is that you upload, uh, as, as, the, as the client, you upload uh, your track or tracks to a secure site, which is managed by our front office, our bookings and, and, and uh, management. Um, you can select an specified engineer for an extra, an extra cost. So what people do, they look at your, your rap sheet. Everybody's on the website. What's everybody been doing? Look at all of the roster, the, the um, you know the lists of what you've been doing, as well as discogs. And okay, well we would like our record to sound like that's what normally happens. So we'll choose sure. we'll choose Jeff or we'll choose Sean. So you upload, you pay you pay the money, upload the tracks to a secure server, then the the, the work is allocated to us, and we get a message in our inbox saying right project uploaded. So. What really sells it is the one free revision. Hmm. So you send your track in, I send it back, you think there's not enough bass in it. You then, through the message section, you are interacting with me. So it's like you're here or you've been here, but you could be in Montevideo, right? So you then say, okay, you got one free go. You can't revise the mix and then send it in you can re i'll revise what you originally sent me uh sent me so you then change it send the changed version back that's it so what people do they send one track as a tester then they send you the other 12. very lucrative wonderful and it runs really really slick it's very slick there's hardly any problems with uploads downloads everything gets there nothing missing it's brilliant it's a wonderful idea. Well, and it, could... fill, yeah, it fills the gaps in, betw in between Coldplay and Pulp or, you know, Ed Sheeran. You're, um, you're, you're doing online and you're, you're hearing music from, again, the, the stuff, some of it, some of it is like so good you can't believe that it's mm. come out of this little town in Texas and they haven't got a record deal. Mm. Some of it is so poor, <laughs> I'm not going to go into it. So if, if, so if somebody comes in with, with, with something that's, um, that's been recorded in a bedroom and they want to try and make it sound like it's recorded in the, the record plant in New York, it's not going to happen, is it? Mm -hmm. So before, before I get to delve into this, sometimes I'm better off saying what you want out of this. I mean, somebody came in once with a CD. It was, it was Luther Vandross with the New York Philharmonic whatever right and some something it was it was just it was a hundred thousand dollar record right and they said look this is our reference and i thought great i love luther vandross right so i listened to it and i thought you know put a file up and i said let's just stop you here you are not going to make this sound anything like that because the mix the, the mixes are they're, st they're stellar apart so I suggest maybe have a revisit, and they've like booked the day or something. So you, you're thinking, mm, you know, but there's always something else to do. So on that occasion, they went away and they made it better. And when they came back, they said, I just want to thank you so much for saying that because you saved us a day of grief in here probably because we wouldn't have got what we wanted. But we went away and we made it better doesn't sound like Luther Vandross, still with the New York Philharmonic, but it sounds better. So you've now got something better to work with. Yeah. yeah. Gives it a chance. And sometimes, sometimes you have to say, you've got to be man enough to say, this isn't, this could be better if you have time and the resources to, to rebalance the mix. Can you do that? Doesn't happen often. But if I want to say it, I'll say it. Because you can't let the tail wag the dog. You can't. You're lost then. You come in here with your band and you start getting involved over here and moving me out of the way. And, you know, oh, Jeff, why don't you do that? Why don't you do this? It's not happening. Come back next week or come back. Go and work with Sean.
<laughs> poor, poor Sean. <laughs> what do you see, Sean? Like he's probably saying, "Go work with Jeff." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's it's, it's a double whammy: world class mastering engineer with the most famous studio in the world. Why wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Why wouldn't it? Yeah. Every you know every 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 mastering room of 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 its that's worthy does it throughout throughout the world you know it's just fantastic right. it's because everybody wants to be here but not everybody can afford the flights and hotels so you're still getting the same signal path we don't have interns in in mastering doing it at night you know the right. graveyard shift if you specify whoever you specify does it and you you inter, you can interact with them if you want that's incredible and every time i get a, an email back um well, you just get a message back saying uh, something like, love the track, you know, uh, what you did was great. Blah, blah, blah. I reply to that email, and I do probably a hundred a month, love right? It. I reply to those emails. Thank you very much for choosing Abbey Road online. Very best, Jeff. Love it. Nothing wrong with manners, is there? No, not at all. No, no. Every, everyone. It's kind of worth the price, me. <laughs> well, you were talking about cutting. Yes. You want to give us a demo? Let's of have that? a little demo, shall we? I've never seen. I mean, I've seen somebody do it, but I've never filmed anybody oh, doing it. Okay. <laughs> um, so what? Okay, what I'm going to do is I'll just. I've done this a million times, so I'm just going to tell you what's yeah, going treat, on with the process. Treat me like an idiot because well, I am number one, no. and B. A lot of people watching this will have absolutely no, no idea, idea what's going on. Yeah, yeah okay. So, so right. Um, this is an aluminium disc with an eighth hour lacquer coating on it. Uh, the, 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 the formula is secret. Uh, nobody knows uh, what it consists of, but it's kind of petroleum based. Um, so the, 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 the idea here is to cut some grooves into this disc without going down to the metal and... Um, to make sure the grooves are deep enough for a pickup to to track the music back, this system works in a in a reverse way to a, a, a record player. This cutter head receives an amplified signal, shouting so loudly, 600 watt transistors full, etching the frequencies through the moving coils into this soft disc. When your uh, record player reproduces what's on this disc. The needle picks up the grooves, the cartridge sends the resonances back to your amplifier and then you get the sound back. That's the easiest way to explain it, a record player in reverse. So, okay, you can hear a hoover pump, uh, suction pump holding the disc down onto, flat onto the turntable. Because we're working at tolerances that are about a hair on your head, everything has to be rock steady and square. So um, this is now just sitting there waiting for me to do something. But as I say, the suction is going to take away the uh, the chip that swarf the swarf that comes out of the back into a glass jar here. Because because this is petroleum based, you'll never see cigarettes in a mastering room with a cutting lathe. This is highly flammable. The um, the swarf chip that comes out. It's like gun cotton. It's, in, it's so flammable. It's 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 a health risk. This is dangerous. So if this catches fire, I'm jumping back. So let's um, get this rolling. So this is now. I've just you can't see it from from there, but I've just dropped the cut head into the into the disc. It's waiting for me to send something to it. So. Um, you won't believe how good this sounds when I play it back. Because it's about the playback, it's not about the cut. So this is just getting something sent to it, whatever. We're listening to the feedback off the cutter coils. We're listening to the master and the, the, the signal split, monitoring and cutting lathe. So this is getting what we're sending to it. We're just, I'm just checking that it's getting the signal. With a disc cutting system, you're cutting the grooves in a, in a uh, concentric spiral. The, the needle drops down on the record and it cuts in a spiral. It doesn't lift off until it's finished. So in order for that to work, you've got to have a preview system. So it's a four channel system, if you like. Stereo preview, stereo mod, modulation. So what the preview system's doing, it's saying, look out lads, here comes a bass drum and it opens the grooves up like that. 
half a turntable revolution before the action happens. So if you were looking literally a, a plan view, a, 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 the way the cutter's working, it's going open, shut, open, shut, open, shut, loud, quiet, loud, quiet, loud, quiet. It's accommodating, the space is accommodating the music and that's defined by the amplitude, the loudness of it and the previews dictating that. So that's a very good question. So, having cut the record, albeit 30 seconds of it, and this is something I would do every morning. We, we're checking the, the, the cutting stylus for noise, uh, looking at the groove formation, because if you start a day with a bad cutting stylus, the whole day is wrong, and that's expensive. So you're checking. As you said earlier on, technical. This is technical. This is bor boring, but not boring. Um, okay. Right, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll put the needle on the record, as they say in the rap game, um, and we'll listen to this at a volume, and it will sound just like the file. Because it's the best turntable in the world cuts the record. Forget about hi-fi. Obviously, the, the, the calibration tone arm on this was the best that we could have ever found, or anyone could have found in... 1979 so it's the it's the best playback system you will ever come across just no doubt so this this should play back okay would you take that back would you go back to the record shop and say this is rubbish so <laughs> the good bit is this right because loads of people say jeff you're not playing the record that's the file stop it you're playing a file back. That is not the pickup. So I do that. It's the pickup. I was going to ask, do you have like a favourite reference you use first thing in the morning? Or? No, 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 no. What I'll do is I'll, uh, whatever I'm cutting first off, if I'm cutting that day, I'll test cut 30 seconds of it and play it back just to make sure the tip's clean and the, you know, it's all, it's no, nothing's broken, you know. How often do you have to change out the tip? Good question. Um, in theory, Every 20 hours in, in a disc, that's not 20 hours in here, every 20 hours in a disc. We used to change them every morning. So 1980, you come in in the morning and you take out the, the, the knackered cutting stylus and you put another one in. Because the guy that's worked the night before, he's left at midnight and he doesn't want to change the cutting stylus before he goes home. It's, it's a bit of a major engineering degree to change a stylus. So this, this um, yellow triangle here is the cut ahead. It's a stereo cut head. So that comes out, goes into a microscope, you flip it upside down. If you look underneath there, you'll see how small the, the, the cutting stylus is. It's big compared to a playback stylus. Um, there's heater wires. We check it in a scope to make sure everything's square. If anything, anything's not square, it's all, it's, it's all out of whack. So with the three guys that we've changed, we've, we've trained on my watch, the hardest thing to show them was changing the cutting stylus. Techies used to do it here. But when I came in, I, I do it. So um, they've all had to learn to do it. But that's fiddly. Because if you drop the cutter head or hurt it, it's five grand for it to go back to Neumann before they even open it up. And we're off the air. So, yeah, tricky. How much is the uh, stylus? Like? They can't be cheap. No, they're not. They're about, uh, about 50 quid. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're not hundreds of pounds. Okay. Um, and they was, but they're they're making them too well at the moment, and the lacquer formula has really improved. So we're getting closer to a hundred hours out of them now. It's like six months. Oh wow. Yeah, so that's really good. So you don't do them every day anymore. Oh wow, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's nice. So yeah, that's that's kind of the process. But obviously, before it gets to what I've just done, you've done all the mastering. You do the vinyl last. So I'll do your, your digital files, you take them away. Most of the releases now are, um, you know, digital and vinyl. The CDs are not, a bit of an obscure format now. But what are you doing that's different when you've mastered, which is specific for... Personally, nothing, just turning nothing. the volume down. So when I master something, as I said to you earlier on, it's fine everywhere. Okay. So forget about digital limiting and stuff. I treat stuff really carefully with the limiting so it's not crushed. So... The, 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 the digital files are fine for vinyl. People that are working louder, 
would probably maybe run the run the vinyl files at a lower level, but I never do. And what about low end? Because we're well, we're... yeah, I mean low end, low end, and low end stereo width is all compromised for vinyl. Um, you can't you can't make a vinyl record as loud as a CD. Um, your 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 this process is over sixty years old, so we're putting twenty first century technology into this, and nothing's changed for sixty years. So if you can cut a record that sounds okay, that's actually brand new, you're doing you're doing all right. Because, you know, tapes from the 50s and 60s that had no real top or bottom or, you know, no real huge sonic diversity, um, they were easy to do. But the stuff now, it's, it's harder sometimes to actually get it and then get, get something that they can press. Because you can cut anything onto this and throw it at a factory, but if they can't replicate it, what's the point? To that end, do you have any... Like plants that you you consider. Well, there's only there's, there's only probably ten left in the world now. But yeah, optimal in Germany. I mean, they're they're the best pressing plant in the world for noise and just QC and everything. They're too fussy, in fact. But that's good. Records have improved. They've had to up the ante because records are an expensive format to buy. You know, they're twenty five quid on Amazon to buy a record. You want something that sounds nice, don't you? Mm -hmm. So you know, a CD is easy. You put the disc into the into the computer, it spits it out the other end, computer says yes. It's it's easy. This is infinitely variable. Whatever, no two records are ever the same. Ever. So that's the that's the skill of it, I think. And it's 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 lovely. Beautiful. Mm. Well there is access there's access to uh, settings here, um, to do with, you know, Pitch control and um, suction, but that's yeah. You need to get you need to get those controls. Just this is a design, really. If you saw an earlier an earlier version of the of one of these, you know, really agricultural, really really. This this is like sp smooth looking. This is like compact. The older cutting lathes are like huge. You know, really manual. This is like easy. I could I could show you. I could teach you how to actually operate this in half an hour. You wouldn't know what you were doing, but you you could offer you could start and finish it. Sometimes the lathe panel here, there's a there's a panel that rattles. So I then go downstairs or I phone up. It's normally events. So I'll ring up Jeremy or someone and say, look, they're going at it down there, it's shaking shaking my trousers off up here. Come on, turn it down. It's three floors up. Everything you want to know about half speed, talk to Miles Shaw. Half speed, great idea. Everything runs at half speed, so all of you, so the stress on the cutting rack is halved. So when you play it back at real time, everything throughout the process has been under stressed. So in theory, you get a better a better sounding disc because that makes sense. Sure, yeah. But you're listening to it half speed. Everything takes twice the time. Records are records, they have clicks, pops and bangs. That's what makes them funky. You know, we're checking TPs for Universal, we're paid to check. So, I checked one this morning, Bastille, right? An album and a seven inch for, for Record Store Day. They've rung me and they said, oh, bit clicky in the office, Jeff. Well, they've emailed me. Okay, have you got your carbon, carbon brush cleaning the record with the anti-static fluid? Uh, no, Jeff, what's that? I'll come back to you, send the test pressings. Played them in here this morning, beautiful. Where do I get a carbon fibre brush, Jeff? And uh, so I sent him an eBay link. That's what we're here for. Service with a smile. All right, dumb question, just selfish question. Go on. Uh, turntables, like- in, Oh, where, in, where do we start? Yeah, but um, this is probably like value for money turntables. Something yeah, yeah. really good that yeah. people could actually buy. Yeah. Audio Technica make one that's a, a twelve ten copy that's in the corner um, yeah. for about three hundred quid. Nice. That's an Audio Technica make cartridges. Yeah. But they they're, they're starting making decks now. That's a really really good. I think it's about three hundred and twenty five quid or something. Really really good budget entry deck for someone who's you know. And if you want to, if you want to get into something a bit more hi fi that 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 will track better. Because what it is, it's all about tracking. 
the 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 better it can track the cartridge, mm -hmm. and the, the the arm and the turntable just makes the record go around at the right speed. It's about the front end and the tone arm. So, the the, the better tracking you have, the less distortion you get. So that comes with more a more expensive cartridge, a more expensive tone arm. Up you go. You could get something. Get something vintage and nice, something like I've got at home for about six hundred quid. And what's that? Thorans TD one sixty. Pronounce it again. Thorans T H O R E N S. They're okay. from the German. Uh, and it's it's. Um, and the model number again? TD one sixty B. I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. Okay. Um, and it was made in nineteen ninety two. And it still goes round at 33 and a third perfectly and tracks. But the cartridge, I've got a cartridge that's full tunes. Because it's my game, isn't it? How much for the cartridge? I it, was, it was donated to me. If you, if you had to buy it? You can't buy it. <laughs> it's an Abbey Road prototype. They never, uh, made it. They never made it. So we, all, we got given, Miles and I got, for our R&D, we got given one each. Boron Shank. All that. Let's not bother with that. It's all too geeky, but it's it's so. I could probably retire on it. <laughs> but the uh, the twelve hundred, which you're alluding to over in the corner, yeah. is that is that still an industry standard? Well, it's kind of because it's got a um, it's got a ninety pound um, Audio Technica stylus on it. It's mm -hmm. a good deck. It's a limited edition one. About three grand they were. Again, we did um, we did a bit of this for Technics. And we got we got given Abbey Road got given the decks, so we put them in all the mastering rooms. But that's that's a wonderful um, checker. And over there by the window, there's a really cheap project um, turntable that I got from Richard Sounds when I joined here. It's like a jump tester. Mm -hmm. So you come up with your test pressing in your, under your arm. You say, Jeff, you've ruined my record. My record's jumping everywhere. I played it in my friend's house, and this is a, this has happened. I've played it in my friend's house. I've played it at my uncle's house, like that's going to make a difference. Um, <laughs> and it's jumping, Jeff, and it's got distorted sibilance on it. I'm getting all this all the way up the stairs, right? Coming in, so okay. We will pop it on the um, on the cheap turntable first. So pop it on the cheap turntable, with the little gals. No sibilance distortion, no jumping. So we played the, the first side, and I'll say then because I'm then ahead of the game. Um, Shall we check the B side then? And then, then the head drops. So this is the good bit. So okay, all right, what we do, we check it on the um, on the three grand Technics turntable with the cheap cartridge now, shall we, John? And, uh, oh, no, 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 there's no need for that, Jeff. No need for that, no need for that. Coat's going back on. Oh, no, 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 John, take your coat off. We we'll check it, we we'll check it on the, on, the, on, the on the Technics. Sit down, I'll get us some tea. Sits down, coat off, put it on there. Oh. Sounds like it's recorded in this room. Tell you what, John, we'll check it on the cutting lathe. <laughs> Best record player in the world. Probably won't jump. We should check it, really. Oh, no, 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 Jeff. No, 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 need, no, no, no need. No need. Ten minutes ago, he's saying, you ruined my record. <laughs> right? But I'm thinking, no, no, no. Let's have every, every last drop out of this, John. <laughs> Pop it on the turntable. Put it on. Oh, Jeff, it sounds wonderful. I thought you said it was ruined. You know. Set your turntable up properly. Set it up so it tracks right, and it's not going like that, and, and the weights are right, and the, the cartridge is compatible, and you've cleaned it with your fibre brush. Before you come up here and say, you've ruined my record. <laughs> you know, most turntables in the, in the ether, not set up correctly, they're, they're, they're not level, or, 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 the, or the floor's moving, or the, this, is, this is fickle. I always love the ones where you go to somebody's house and there's a penny on, on it. Yeah, well, if it makes it work, <laughs> if it makes it work, but it's probably too heavy, so it'll never yeah, jump. Exactly. You know. Yeah. So it's all about setting your turntable up. But most people, they've, they've got a turntable. They just plug it in and play, and it's all wonky. What chance have I got? But I can't let John, who wants to put his coat back on, I can't take his word that his record's jumping until I've checked it. And I, even at home, if it's not jumping on four decks that are calibrated properly, it's not jumping. Like I said, you've got to be patient. 
mastery engineer. Sometimes you've got to just try not to swear. <laughs> so, Jeff, as you told us earlier, you love using hardware. I do. As opposed to plugins, etc. Yes. So can you uh, give us a bit of a tour of your okay. hardware? Okay. So this desk um, is, is a custom uh, console, but it's, it's, it's built around these um, EMI TG modules. You'll see around the building, you'll see multi-track versions of these, but these, these are stereo derivatives of that, um, of those made at the, the EMI factory down at Hayes in the 70s, all gold contacts. You know, this is why they're still working now beautifully built and all modular so if anything packs up we've got modules downstairs if the filter doesn't work we pull we, we pull the module out put a tone through one downstairs pop it back in and we're away same with the fader um so the plugins are designed around these around these modules the the, the parametric the limiter the tone controls the filters um so using that as our mainframe for 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 analog We've added various stuff that Christian and I like into the sound chain that's also analog, uh, that we feel that are the more relevant tools to, to, to what we're doing. So the Manly here, that's a nice, a nice parametric, you know, very smooth. Uh, the Prism, uh, Prism Sound parametric compressor. Alicia compressor here, very, very state-of-the-art. Um, probably the newest bit of kit we, we've bought recently. Uh, lovely compressor, stereo width, and a Sontek uh, 432. This is, in my opinion, the best mastering equaliser equalizer in, in, in existence. These are in all the best rooms in the States. Um, it's America, uh, built, built by a guy stateside, hand-built. He builds probably, in his pomp, he was only building 10 or 12 units a year. Uh, an expensive item, but the best mastering eq you can you can have in, in in my opinion so with all this you need to cobble it together so we we have a, a a nice signal path here where we can isolate everything in the chain so if i don't want to listen to this or have stuff going through it i can isolate it at a press of a button take stuff out put stuff in i don't want the filter take the filter out transformers front of the desk back of the desk every everything is we can insert or take away, or take away everything at any given time, which makes this console very versatile for for, for, for various listening points. So that that that's good. The, the the most the most important thing in in a mastering room is a, is a clean signal path. Some would say a clean signal path and bullshit, but the the clean signal path <laughs> is by far the most important thing. And this this console is quiet from DC to daylight. Nice. Hmm. <laughs> and bullshit. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> that was to make sure people were listening, paying yeah. attention. Yeah. <laughs> what is this? Metering. So the limiter value. Yeah, if the for the for the um for the EMI limiter, yeah. you can switch you can switch the metering. So you can look at the you can look at the the amplitude amplitude limiter which is here. Oh, I see. Which is which is basically a fa a phase device. Yeah. Or you can you can look at the control, which is here. Again, this is this is moving the metering round to different parts of the desk. I see. And these noise meters are noise. There's some. I think the the, the, the actual meters bent there. But if if something was to crop up now in the signal path, which was humming or or a rumble or whatever, these these noise meters would be flickering. So we'd see, hopefully hear it as well, that something was going on in the console that 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 shouldn't be there. NS10 is a choice <clears throat> because when you started, pretty much everybody in the world was listening yes. to NS10, so you could hear what they were hearing. Yeah, a good a good radio reference monitor. Uh, monitors are just so subjective. What you like is what you like. But every, every, I've worked in five different mastering rooms around London, and I've always worked off of these. Um, so much so that when I came here, uh, I actually got the, the same amplifier that was in the townhouse to drive them. Oh, which is what? It's a Bryston. A Bryston. So um, with with that kind of high end amplification, they sound more like speakers than than NS10s. Right. They sound like a good hi fi speaker. Uh, and again, they're on stand, so they, you get the low end off them. Um, oh, so they're on the ice. They're on like little pucks, yeah. yeah. So they actually sound like speakers rather than this like screechy radio, horrible NS10s. They sound they're a small, a, a true 
small speaker and for me a true uh, radio reference. I, I'll, I'll mono and, and switch one side off so then I'm treating it like an Alexa speaker so I can hear what, what it's going to sound like in a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a mono environment. Um, again, just something else to check. With the, with the Bowers, um, I suppose, what is the balance between the two? Well, I mean, you, you know, you have to, you have to have uh, your your main monitoring in a room like this is 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 all, because you have to be able to hear something that's very low and and you just the, 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 in terms of um, high end too. But yeah, you, you have to be able to hear changes, and I have to um, be able to tune you to the room as well. If you come up here as a as a client for the first time, and everything you hear in here is totally double Dutch. You're gonna you're gonna be perplexed. You need to be able to hear the changes that I'm making to your to your tunes mm -hmm. when I show you a before and after. So with with these Bowers and Wilkins, these Nautilus speakers in this room, they 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 work. They work. We, they've been up here for b before my time, and when you when you move mastering rooms, it's like a divorce. You you're <laughs> you, you're moving into an environment that you, you you're unfamiliar with. And bear in mind that you've got to start working. You've got to produce to a standard that you did before. Um, so you have to be able to hear the changes. So they, I got to know those and was able to listen through those speakers very quickly and was able to start working here competently within a week. Wow. Mm. What, what other speakers did you use in other rooms? Uh, they were big Genelex in the townhouse in a wood-panelled front wall, um, Bryston amplification, a lot harder. These are quite soft. These are a lot softer. Um, but what you do, you 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 tune yourself to what you're given in terms of monitors. If I went next door to Sean's room in in three or four days, I would I would have I would attune to it and just get used to it. You get what you, you kind of get what you're given. But of all the things that they changed for me in 2006 when I came here and lots of this stuff was was purchased. The one thing I didn't want to change was the monitors, which I was surprised at actually, because I would have shouted about it if I wasn't happy. Wonderful. Mm. That's a great indictment of them. Yeah. Um, what do we have down here before we move, before we finish up? Okay, well, we had a, we had a hole in that rack, so what we, we, we thought, well, for just to be aesthetically pleasing, we'd, we'd fill it up with modules, with spares, if you like, rather than just have a blank, two blank panels here. So if we, you know, again, if one of the modules over there doesn't doesn't play ball, um, we can we can we can use one of these oscillator here for tones. We're forever putting tones through stuff to check uh, room clock. So everything's everything's rejittered and, and clocked to the same clock. So we don't we don't get jitter and noise. Um, this is our digital patch bay. So I come in in the morning. A uh, bit like a telephone exchange. Digitally, I plug everything up the way I want the signal path to go digitally, and it's set for the day. Um, nice hardware digital limiter for taking off reds, so when you're working loud, that's what I use to to, to get my stuff up to Spotify level. Um, again, just all nice tools, but again, we've, we've got more analog. You know, it's just, this room, this room is analog. Decent converters, benchmark, front and back, D to A, A to D. Another listening converter for, for headphones if you want. Um, just just the best of really. Um, you, you, you've been a Benchmark fan for a while. Yeah, we're just we're just doing up. We're just going to move to Benchmark three actually uh, as as an upgrade because they've been in it for quite a while. Um, but again, converters. It, it's it's all got to be neutral. You can't. I've got all the all the EQ and stuff in the desk to 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 put more bass in or put more top in or whatever. You don't want the converters coloring anything. I'm here to colour the sound, not the converter. I see. Absolutely amazing. Digital delay, is that there? Well, as I said to you earlier, when we're cutting, uh, we're cutting records, we did a previous system. So this would be the cutting. This, was, uh, this is an antiquated uh, cutting delay. So you'd have the delay and the main signal, a four-channel path for the, the cutting system. As I said, delaying the signal, a turntable revolu uh, revolution, so the grooves can snuggle and, and not smash into each other. At the moment, we're using this TC thing as our cutting delay. It's better, newer, newer electronics, better for sibilance, signal to noise, or whatever. But that's just in there as a backup. If this dies, I can st I can plug this in and start and still cut records. It's, it's a spare. This 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 place is full of spares, 
and a great tech, great tech team. So that's how we get by. Amazing. Jeff, thank you ever so much. You're welcome. It's been a lot of fun. Great. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Please leave any comments and questions below. So long, farewell. Avi Dazan, au revoir, adios. See Goodbye. you later.